Oh, totally. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm super excited this morning to have uh, a colleague and uh, a former Canadian colleague and currently now in the US and, uh, and a good friend in Ishmael El Um Ishmael and I have known each other for years uh, when we kind of started residency at around the same time. Uh, he was at the Montreal Heart Institute and me at uh, Dow. And obviously we've been to uh, many of the same meetings and Ishmael has, um, has gone on and done amazing things. Not only did he complete his residency at the Montreal Heart Institute, he did a fellowship uh, and his PhD with Dr. Magdi Yacoub uh, in London um, and uh, came back on staff at the Montreal Heart. And uh, obviously one of, his, uh, one of his areas of specialty, one of his many areas of specialty uh, was specifically the Ross procedure. And uh, he and Dr. Nancy Poirier really kind of helped to kind of refine that procedure and, and, and re-offer it, I feel like, to, to the masses where once upon a time it had become just an, an asterisk in the textbooks as to what used to be done for people with aortic stenosis. And the Ross has clearly made a resurgence. Uh, and um, this is a talk that I really thought would be interesting for our group. I mean, we've We've got a lot of expertise here. We've got a lot of aortic expertise in the form of Dr. Pozag. And um, one of the questions was, you know, should we be offering the Ross procedure for non-elderly patients with severe aortic stenosis, whether it be here or at another center of excellence? Um, and um, I, with that in mind, I invited Ishmael, who kindly obliged. And Ishmael, thanks so much. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a privilege for me to be with you, uh, albeit online. I would have preferred to be there in person. I was... Uh, in New Brunswick a couple of years ago at Dr. Buick's meeting, and I really enjoyed the two days that I spent there. So hopefully um, things get back to normal and, uh, and I get to visit again that sometime soon. So the question today is, should every program be offering the Ross procedure? And I'll try to split that into two things. One, what is the role of the Ross procedure? And secondly, we can address the question of should every program or, or comprehensive health programs. But this is what we're talking about, a 53-year-old patient with severe aortic stenosis. You see the valve is bicuspid, very calcified. He's got normal ejection fraction and no other real comorbidities. He's otherwise healthy and active. What do we propose to these patients? This patient? Do we put a mechanical valve? Do we put a, a, as large a tissue valve as we can? Or do we propose a Ross procedure? Or is there any role for it? And my first point that I would like to submit to you is the notion that conventional aortic valve replacement in young adults is associated with excess long-term mortality. So Although the short-term results are great, the long-term results may not be as, as excellent as we think we're doing uh, when we're discharging the patients. This is a study that dates now, it's 20 years old, but it's relevant because in Sweden, all the patients go into a national registry and can be followed long-term. And they looked at observed versus expected survival of patients after aortic valve replacement. And what you notice is after about seven years or so, in black is the observed mortality and white is the expected mortality in the age and sex match population. And you can see that there's excess mortality that starts to set in about seven, eight years after surgery. Intuitively, you may think that this is probably driven by the older patients who are very sick or old or have other comorbidities. But the reality is that once they stratified the patients according to their age at the time of surgery, surprisingly, the younger patients, the ones un the, under the age of 50 had the highest OE ratio at 4.5. And the older the patients were, the closer the OE ratio was to one. So in other words, the younger the patient is at the time of surgery, the higher the excess mortality is in the long term. So that's the first thing that I want to propose. And I'll show you some other studies that focus really on this patient population. This is one that we did after I started my practice in Montreal. I asked, what about in Canada? How are our patients doing at the Montreal Heart? We looked at 470 consecutive isolated elective mechanical AVRs in patients under 65. Ismail Bahut, who then was a medical student who's now a, a, a future bright star in our field who's doing congenital fellowship at Columbia here in New York, um, looked at this and we excluded anything that, had, that we thought may impact long-term survival, concomitant procedures, coronary disease, dissections, endocarditis, and so on. The mean age was 53, just like our patient, and the mean follow-up was nine years. So pretty significant duration of follow-up. And when we compared survival to that of the Quebec age and sex match general population, you can see that again, you see that survival gap at 10 years that continues to increase up to 15 years after surgery. Well, I mean, that's not exactly what we're proposing to the patient or what we hope we'd be doing to the patient. In fact, when we combined reoperation and mortality, survival free from reoperation at 10 years was a mere 82% in a 50-year-old undergoing isolated elective mechanical AVR. 
In other words, at 10 years, one in five of these patients was either dead or reoperated. And that was mainly driven by death rather than reoperation. Well, what about tissue valves? We're using less and less mechanicals now. This is another study, um, large study from the uh, Cleveland Clinic. And the conclusions were very similar. Younger patients had worse than expected survival that was further diminished with insertion of a small prosthesis, introducing the notion of patient prosthesis mismatch, particularly with tissue valves. This is another study from France, 2,500 patients. And again, they did something similar to the Swedish study. They stratified the patients according to their age at the time of surgery. And in black, what you see is the observed survival after AVR, tissue AVR. And in gray is the expected survival in the age and sex matched French general population. And you see the older patients had an OE ratio of close to one. But as the patients got younger, the OE ratio for mortality became wider and wider. So again, younger patients have a higher mortality burden. This is a re more recent study from Sweden. Again, 4,000 isolated AVRs in patients under 60. And again, they stratified them by age. And you can see that the younger patients have a wider gap in observed and expected survival versus the older patients where observed and expected are the same. And finally, the study that you'll probably have seen from the New England Journal looking at California-wide data 10,000 patients undergoing isolated AVR under 65 years of age. And they stratified the patients between 45 and 54, 15 year mortality of almost one in three to one in four patients. 55 to 64, one in three patients were dead, 15 years down the line. So you're talking about a 50 year old patient and you're telling him that he has about a one in three to one in four chance of not being alive 15 years only down the line. He won't hit his 65th um, uh, year birthday, which you know, is not exactly what we think. So I think anytime we are considering AVR in these young adults, we're always trying to think about the differences between mechanical versus tissue prosthesis and the benefits. And what I would suggest is that we should rather look at the similarities between mechanical and tissue prosthesis. And the similarities are the fact that they are acellular, non-living substitutes that have no potential for growth, repair, or adaptation. And so conventional aortic valve in young adults is far from being a curative approach. It is at best a palliative approach. The curves that I showed you, if you showed them in, in, a, in an oncology meeting, it would be pretty consistent with, with what one would expect in an oncology meeting. We assume that we're doing better because patients look so, so well after when they come back for their visits, but the data when we look at it in the long term is more sobering than it than we think it is. And so the question is, why is that the case? And I think the answer is twofold. One is hemodynamics, and secondly is biology. And the first point, hemodynamics, we really have to think patient prosthesis mismatch when we're considering aortic valve surgery in young adults. It's perhaps not as relevant in older patients, but in the younger patients, it's much more relevant. And unfortunately, patient prosthesis mismatch is a very prevalent issue. It's about 40 to 45 percent of patients leaving the hospital after aortic valve replacement have some degree of moderate to severe mismatch. And why is mismatch relevant, particularly in young patients? Because we know from previous data, and this is just one study in the literature, that in younger patients, also in patients with slightly reduced ejection fractions, uh, the presence of mismatch directly impacts survival in the long term. It is not as relevant in older patients over the age of 70. And just to, you know, a quick note on, on TAVAR versus uh, SAVAR, you know, we often, often hear the notion that TAVAR has great hemodynamics and has resolved the issue of PPM, but the reality is slightly different. Again, if you look at the data from the PARTNER-3 trial, the incidence of moderate severe mismatch in the TAVAR and SAVAR group was actually very similar between the two at 34% and still 30% in the surgical group, despite annular enlargement and you know, trying to put large prosthesis and so on. So PPM is still a very relevant problem that we have not solved. And secondly is biology. The aortic root is much more than just a passive structure that opens and closes. It really performs a lot of very sophisticated functions. As Ansar uh, alluded to, I spent four years in the lab um, under uh, Sir Magdi Yacoub's supervision. And the title of my PhD thesis was The Living Aortic Valve. I was literally in the lab looking at the cellular and molecular structure and function of aortic valve leaflets. And I can, you know, I'm not going to spend time going um, into this, but I can, I can safely tell you that these structures are 
so much more than just open closed mechanisms. They are so sophisticated. They adapt to all kinds of different conditions. They can contract, they can relax, they can change their um, elastic modulus in response to various um, uh, stimuli. It is just a real work of, of creation, nature, art, whatever you want to call it, but it really is far more than just a, 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 uh, uh, an inert sort of structure. And that translates into perfect laminar flow with no resistance, no impedance to the ventricle, perfect coronary flow reserve, all kinds of things that really impact, you know, for us with normal aortic valves, our everyday life, and for patients with um, aortic valve replacements, their long-term prognosis. And from a clinical standpoint, having um, that living structure that performs all these functions translates into good durability of a normal tricuspid aortic valve, excellent hemodynamics, both at rest and with exercise, low thrombogenicity because um, endothelial cells produce NO and prevent platelet um, aggregation, and good resistance to infections as well. And when we look in the long term after AVR, all of these, all of these uh, uh, characteristics that I mentioned, the durability, the hemodynamics, the likelihood of endocarditis, thrombogenicity, and need for anticoagulation, all of these are what determine what we call clinically relevant endpoints, such as survival, valve-related complications, and even quality of life, although very hard to quantify, but still very intimately related to a combination of all of these things. So the question is, what is the role of the ROS procedure in that context, now that we've laid the, um, the state of the, uh, of the union, if one would say, um, as it stands? Well, the ROS is really the only replacement operation that guarantees long-term viability of the aortic valve and aortic root. We have explants up to 30 and 40 years after the ROS. And when we look under the microscope, we, we see the, that trilaminous structure. We see endothelial interstitial cells. We see fibrosa, we see ventricularis. All of it is, is, is preserved. It's not exactly like a native aortic valve, but it's very close to it. And importantly, it has adapted to become more of an aortic phenotype than a pulmonary phenotype. And the unique thing about the ROS is that it, because it's a living structure and it's autologous, it comes with unique biological as well as hemodynamic features. And the question is, does that translate into improvements in clinically relevant outcomes? And before I go into this, I'm sure you've all heard these notions, or some of you are perhaps even thinking those that, you know, either don't believe in the ROS or it transforms a single valve disease into a double valve disease. They all come back for reoperation. And, and more recently, why don't we just put a large tissue valve in and have the patient come back for a valve and valve? And I'll show you why some of these are maybe just a little exaggerated and one should rethink slightly these, um, some of these thoughts. 20 minutes and answer was very strict about the, the, the time. Uh, um, uh, it's obviously too little to talk about the ROS. So I invite any of you who are interested to take a deeper dive into this, to read this fabulous um, uh, review that Amin Mazin, who's an, an incredible resident in, at the University of Toronto uh, wrote um, together with some you know, very um, illustrious authors, Bob Bono, Yacoub, Tyrone David. And it really does cover the topic very, very comprehensively. Um, I'll focus on just one outcome, and that is survival. And the reason is survival is a binary outcome. You're neither half alive nor half dead, although we all will argue that most of the time we're somewhere in between. But, but, the, but for our patients looking in the long term, you know, it's not like a six-minute walk test or an NYHA sort of. It really is a pretty hard endpoint. And so I'll show you some of the data that's come out in the last 10 years. And it's a real tsunami of data, actually. Um, I, I was privileged enough when I was in London to analyze these data, which um, derived from a pr prospective randomized trial, one of the rare ones in our open surgical valve literature, uh, where Professor Yacoub uh, randomized patients, young patients to undergo either a ROS or homograft aortic root replacement for aortic valve disease. Now, you may argue, you know, why homographs? This was in the 90s, and homographs were quite um, favored uh, back then still, even for elective cases. These were patients who were age 39 at the time of surgery, and they were really not cherry-picked. As you can see here, 8% of the patients were operated on for active endocarditis, and almost half the patients were redo operations, with the most frequent previous operation being a homograft root replacement. So by no means were these patients destined to have very good long-term outcomes. And yet, when we looked at their long-term outcomes up to 13 years, you can see that the 
survival of the Ross cohort is exactly identical to the UK age and sex match general population, whereas patients with homographs had a, a lower survival uh, as the years uh, went by. Well, other groups then started looking at their results with their uh, cohorts of Rosses. Tyrone was the first one to do so. And in, in that later in that same year, he published this data on JCVS. 200 patients, the mean age is 34. The mean follow-up is 10 years, so pretty significant durations of follow-up. And you can see that at 15 years, survival is almost indistinguishable from the Ontario age and sex match population. And then he uh, uh, updated his data a few years later with now a median follow-up of 14 years. I mean, we're talking real long-term follow-up here. And you can see survival is identical to the general population. Survival free from reoperation at 20 years is around 70 to 75%. But importantly, it's mainly driven by reoperation rather than death, as opposed to what I showed you earlier with the mechanical AVR. This is another study that was published a couple of weeks ago in Jack. This is a, because one may say, well, Yakub, Tyrone, they're all masterful surgeons and none of us can replicate these data. Well, the Germans put all their data into a national Ross registry and um, almost 2,500 patients in 10 sites. The mean age was 44 and the mean follow-up was 11 years. And you can see that up to 25 years survival remains identical to the German age and sex match general population. And the rate of reintervention the combined rate of reintervention, despite this data going back to 1988, was around 1.3% patient year. So very respectable uh, reoperation rates, all things considered. Um, this is another study from the UK showing a similar signal of better survival free from reop in the Ross versus prosthetic AVR. This is a study from uh, Australia, uh, Peter Skillington's group, again, a 10% survival difference at 15 years between uh, Ross and mechanical AVR. This is recent data that I published that I presented last weekend at the ATS meeting, where we looked at New York and California wide data and did a propensity match analysis of patients aged 18 to 50, where again, we really excluded anything that may impact uh, outcomes of the patients in the long term. And you can see that the Ross cohort had similar survival to the general population, whereas mechanical and tissue AVR had lesser or lower survival. Um, these are the rates of reoperation, higher in the ROS than with mechanical AVR, but lower than with tissue AVR. But importantly, stroke rates were 5% in mechanical, after mechanical AVR at 15 years, and major bleeding was 8%. So almost a 1% patient year of major bleeding or stroke um, after a mechanical AVR in patients under the, under the age of 50. Pretty significant. And I, you know, time doesn't allow me, but if you look at 30-day mortality after these events, they're very different from 30-day mortality after reoperation. So I don't think all valve-related complications are, are created equal, but we can discuss that further. So there are many more studies in the literature, but all of them show the same signal, late survival being identical to the general population. So I'd submit to you that it is really the only replacement operation that restores long-term survival following a aortic valve replacement. Um, Answer is telling me I only have two minutes left. So I'll skip through some of these other points. I wanted to discuss the Achilles heel of how come we're not doing more ROS or how come it's really been abandoned from the um, our uh, armamentarium. I think surgical risk, which really ties into the title of this presentation, every program be doing it. And durability is the other question. And I'll really go very quickly, uh, Ansar. But just to show that this is our program in Montreal. When I started my practice in 2010, we really had no ROS program and all, and a very sort of um, uh, uh, timid uh, valve repair and sparing program. And you can see that we build our program over time. The reason I show this is that we always say, oh, we have to send these patients to an established program, but an established program doesn't, is not established until it gets established. So it, it, you know, if we keep thinking like that, we're caught in a vicious circularity. So someone has to start somewhere. And I think if, if there's expertise and there's a team, I think that is a reasonable combination. And, and just to show you, in our cohort of over 500 patients there, our operative mortality was very comparable to um, standard aortic valve replacement. And there's definite, definitely a learning curve. Both mortalities occurred early in the, in the series with none in our last 400 plus patients now. Um, so I'll skip through some of these. I mentioned hemodynamics as being one of the reasons why I think um, with conventional AVR, we have these issues in the long term. In this series, there were no there was no incidence of moderate or severe patient prosthesis mismatch. 
And importantly, the gradients start low and they continue to be low because these valves do not degenerate. Durability, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, suffice it to say that if it's done properly, it can uh, be performed with about a 1% patient year reoperation uh, range. So I think the paradigm has evolved from the simple question of anticoagulation versus reoperation in young patients to really considering survival and quality of life first before we address any of that. Of course, guidelines guide our practice. And unfortunately, I don't think guidelines are a real good representation of what the literature actually shows. And I only showed you part of the literature. But the most recent iteration still has the Ross as a class 2B indication, which means that it may be considered in a comprehensive valve center. And I, I will let you just reflect on, on that versus the one, the class 1 level A indication to do a TAVR in patients sick over the age of 65 with just one year data. Uh, one year outcome data. It's, it's, um, to me, it, 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 it just meant, it suggests that there's real misalignment between evidence and recommendations, at least as it comes to the Ross procedure. And part of it is, I recently wrote this editorial with Rick Nishimura and, his, and Carol Warnes um, in, uh, in Jack, and we really, we agonized over the language and how to really express everything and to try to, you know, be critical of the guidelines, but yet be respectful of them. And what he said what he you know kept repeating was the notion that the guidelines have to reflect what is being what can be performed in the majority of centers for the majority of patients so it becomes a little bit difficult to have sort of niche procedures in the guidelines and i think that's where the the, the real issue um, sort of lies um, but in summary i think the ROS can be done with similar operative risk if performed in in um, centers where there are dedicated teams uh, it definitely restores late survival, at least into the second decade. We didn't really go too much into valve-related complications, but um, certainly better freedom from them, better hemodynamics, both at rest and with exercise, and um, excellent quality of life. So to answer, answer us questions, should every program be offering the ROS? The answer is no, but I do think that the ROS is the best operation to treat aortic stenosis in young and middle-aged adults, as Tyrone said. Uh, with that, again, answer. I hope I stuck to time. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I know it's it was I, I go pretty quickly through these slides, but 20 minutes is so hard to squeeze everything about Ross uh, in a in a talk. But I'll be happy to take any questions. Ishmael, thanks so much. I think that's a phenomenal review, uh, and I think it really kind of makes you think a lot about you know, what it is that the right thing to do is I saw two patients in their early 50s yesterday, both of whom had severe aortic stenosis. And, you know, naturally I'm, and, and let's be honest, nobody wants a mechanical valve anymore. Uh, you know, they naturally are hoping that you will lead them towards the tissue valve because they don't want to see the, the thought of, of uh, or experience the thought of having to be on an anticoagulant lifelong. And, you know, in my hands, they're get, they're going to get a bioprosthetic valve, and I'm hoping for a big valve so that one day I can then be able to put a valve and valve tabby and on and on and on. So, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a sobering uh, presentation in that it makes me wonder if I am actually doing the right thing because what I'm experiencing is short-term euphoria, but I'm not there to experience a long-term dysphoria, for lack of a better term. Um, JF, uh, just a uh, I, did you uh, did you have a question or any comments from your end? No, absolutely. I think uh, thank you, Ismail. I wish I had my camera working, but for some reason my computer doesn't recognize my camera, so <laughs> I'm having some technical issues. I, I I think answer you put the point quite rightly, but maybe I can answer ask a question to Ismail. You know, if we were uh, to to think of patients, are there patients you don't consider? What are the patients that you don't want to see referred to? Or, you know, you've mentioned some of the ones that you would, uh, but you know, centers like us, we we have the ability also to sub-select patients that we really feel strongly should go to a center potentially. Uh, those are things to consider. And what what is your advice from a referring center potentially? And as we start thinking about this and eventually potentially building a program, you start you have to start thinking somewhere. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. I think the um, the ones in whom a ROS would be not the not the ideal solution are patients with connective tissue disorders, patients who have a life expect an anticipated life expectancy of less than 15 years or so would probably not stand to benefit fully from the 
you know, from the long-term sort of realization of the of these benefits. So patients with any end organ dysfunction, whether it's kidney disease, liver disease, lung disease, any or heart failure, you know, advanced. Uh, that is not necessarily related to, directly to their valve and reversible, I think these are patients that would not necessarily benefit. Patients with autoimmune disorders have a slightly higher rate of reintervention re after the ROS than these other patients because, of, uh, because that same process can, can uh, impact the pulmonary valve once in the aortic position. So these are main, the main patients that, you know, that definitely sort of are not very good candidates. Patients with aortic regurgitation that are not repairable and a di very dilated aortic annulus are certainly a more challenging cohort. Um, they seem to derive the same long-term survival benefit, uh, but they certainly, um, you know, unless it's performed very sort of carefully, the reoperation rate will certainly be higher than patients with AS. So I think the ideal substrate is a patient with a life expectancy of 15 or 20 years, anticipated life life, 15, 20 years or more, and um, uh, with AS and no sort of major comorbidity. Eduardo? Oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Jan. Uh, yeah, would you comment for two seconds just also on sometimes we, you know, that not all aortic stenosis are created equal uh, in terms of, you know, some have very severe and it's obviously the problem. Other have LVH with hypertension and the AS is not that bad. Uh, do you have any tricks to how to, does that affect also your results from a Ross point of view? Um, I, I'm unaware of any data that, you know, that went into the granularity of trying to, to, to look at, um, at, at these two sort of subgroups. Uh, what I will say is that because of the hemodynamic, it really is an operation where hemodynamically, it's, it's just like having a native valve. You always have a gradient in the single digits. And we just recently finished a study in, you know, when I was in Montreal, uh, where we exercised patients with a, a ROS versus those with a mechanical valve years after the operation. And both sets of valves were completely functional. And with the exercise, the gradients in, in the mechanical group go up, you know, significantly into the moderate sort of stenosis range. And with the exercise in the ROS, it stays in the single digit range. And the wow. reality is that all the echoes we do in the mismatch we talked about is really at rest. And that only mimics your conditions when you're sleeping at night or resting on the couch. But the majority of these young patients are running up and down and running after the kids and skiing and running and jogging. And their out cardiac output is much higher than it is at rest. And therefore, the, the strain on the LV uh, is, is higher than what we see in the echo lab. So I think any notion of LV, I mean, the more severe the LV damage is, I think the more benefit there is to derive from having something that is as hemodynamically, um, uh, you know, as hemodynamically uh, performant as a, the pulmonary autograph is. Yeah. Blanco? Thanks, Ismail. It was uh, really good. Jeff asked a couple of the questions I wanted to ask, but like a lot of people, I was, you know, early on a somewhat of a detractor for the Ross procedure, I think for all the reasons you outlined, but, you know, with the work you've been doing and the increase in data in the last 10 years and, um, and, uh, and, uh, sorry. <laughs> and the challenges of Zoom. <laughs> and, um, you know, the other big thing is the increase in comfortability with the valve sparing root procedure and, a uh, better understanding of functional anatomy of the, of the aortic root. And, you know, we've developed a good program here and doing a lot of valve sparing roots, bicuspids, big annuluses, and leaflet repairs. And I think that's opened the door significantly to, you know, to us considering the ROS now in a viable manner, you know? Um, so part of I want to ask Jack, you know, what is, what are the, you know, characteristics of a successful clinical program, the patients to select, not select, which you've talked about already, and, you know, um, you know um, uh, the other thing being, uh, so that's essentially it. And then the other thing is uh, a very specific sort of anatomical question is a lot of these patients with AS who have, you know, moderate size aortic aneurysms, you know, 4.5 or 4.8 or, or you, know, you know, not ones you'd operate on individually, but you're gonna do, do it concomitantly regardless you know, are those, how do you manage those? And do you consider the, doing the ROS in, the, in those patients uh, who have otherwise sort of stock standard aortic stenosis, but you know, a 48 millimeter ascending aorta. Are those patients we should reasonably consider to start out doing as well or, or not? Yeah, thanks, Laco. Yeah, I'll start with the last question. Definitely so. I think these patients are, are you know, I, I, I've never turned them down because of some degree of aortic enlargement. Uh, almost 60% of the patients in my cohort have 
some degree of aortic replacement going up to hemi arch in about 12% of the patients. Um, and, and so far, it really hasn't impacted the, the, the durability of the valve itself or, the, or, or the, the surgery itself. So I think these patients are candidates. Otherwise, we'll be eliminating half the patients with bicuspid AS. Um, the, the, um, the, to answer your first question, I think the, you know, it's hard to say what the best components are, but it definitely does take a team. It's not just one person who wants to do it. So it has to take commit involvement and commitment from the cardiology, the, the anesthesia, perfusion, ICU, all these people have to be committed and be, be you know, buying into the, the program. So you, I think that's number one. Um, number two is obviously having a, a, a surgeon to lead the program. So, you know, in this case, for example, yourself, um, and it's not about doing, you know, 50 Rosses period a year. I think it, it fits within an aortic root reconstructive program, as I like to say, which involves exactly what you said, which is, you know, valve sparing surgery, aortic valve repair, just understanding all the nuances of aortic root reconstruction of uh, commissural symmetry, basal ring, the anatomy, all things that sound very simple if you're not a surgeon, but you know, when you're an aortic root surgeon, you, you know that there are many different sort of variations on the theme. The good news is that even if you walk into the OR and you, you know, your plan A is to do a ROS and for whatever reason you decide that I'm not comfortable with this anatomy, there's always a plan B, which is, well, just do your the regular operation. There's no harm done by doing so. And so you can always bail and just, right. you know, so I always go in with a plan A and a plan B with the patients. And anytime I'm not comfortable or for what, yesterday I was doing ROS, it was big, big fenestrations on the pulmonary valve. First time I see it, I just, I did a tissue AVR. Um, so, you know, wow. it's, uh, it's not, it's not like you've taken something out and all of a sudden you're left with half the heart chopped out and you don't know what to do. <laughs> um, so in that sense, it's, it's good. Right. But I think as long as it fits within a, an active program with a dedicated surgeon who's, you know, whose main focus is aortic sur root surgery, I think it, these, are th these are the main ingredients for a successful program. And as you know, there are many successful examples now across the country. You know, I was lucky enough to to help a, a bunch of programs in, in London, in, uh, in Toronto, in, uh, in, in um, Hamilton, in uh, Victoria, in uh, um, uh, Calgary. Vancouver, in Calgary, and all of these now, in Sherbrooke, uh, all of these now have uh, uh, active ROS programs. So I think it is doable. I think we don't want to fall in the trap of the 90s where all programs are doing it. And that's why to answer Ansar's question, the answer was no initially. But I think in programs with, with real serious commitment, I think it can be done safely. Uh, and very last question, just about reasons for reoperation and then what are the reoperations in these people? Are you just going in and replacing the valve uh, or are you doing a TAVI you know, in these patients? So that's the last question and we'll, we'll obviously let everyone go. Sure. The the uh, it, it's about a half and half. The the either the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve that may require reoperation. Overall, the reoperation rate is about one percent per year, at least within the first fifteen to twenty years, if the operation is done properly in the first place. Um, when it's the pulmonary homogram, because we replace the pulmonary valve with a pulmon with the cadaveric pulmonary root, so it's a pulmonary homograph. And whenever that one that one is uh, fails, and it's typically pulmonary stenosis the approach in the vast majority of cases will be a transcatheter approach. And we used to put melody valves. Now we put a stent and then we deploy a sapient valve in that. It's, it's, there's less incidence of endocarditis than with the melodies and less stent fractures. And they also come at larger sizes, which the melody is a bit limited in that sense. Um, that works very effectively. Um, the only caveat is if the left main on the CT scan is less than three millimeters from the back side of the um, pulmonary homograph, there could be a risk of, of, uh, of uh, um, obstruction of the, uh, of the left main. So it's important to blow a balloon in the cath lab anytime there's doubt and to see if we see any change on echo or EKG and so on. Uh, for the aortic side, so the native pulmonary that's now the neo-aortic valve, if that one fails, it's typically either primary regurgitation or regurgitation secondary to pulmonary root dilatation. Um, if it is the latter, we try to do a valve sparing operation and we're successful in, in most cases. If it's the former, which is primary valve failure, which can happen, um, then it just is simply a, a valve replacement with them. Unfortunately, TAVAR is still not an option in these cases because one of the benefits of the ROS is that these valves do not calcify. So they really remain very 
I mean, when you, we go back and we look at them, they just look like native aortic valves that are not calcified. Um, so with the current technology, no TAMARs are you, you know, possibly usable on the left side, but who knows, maybe the Yena valve or some other technology down the line will be potentially uh, suitable, but not for now. Ishmael, thanks so much. I think that was a great overview. I think uh, given us a lot of food for thought. I think as lactose indicated, I think, uh, you know what, we've got the right ingredients here to kind of get this going. And I, I can foresee this happening in the next couple of years. And, uh, uh, but you know what, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's always nice to know that we've got leaders in the field uh, that we have access to that will help us develop this program. And we look forward to collaborating with you down the road on this, on this front. So Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and for joining us from, uh, from New York. It sounds exciting. It sounds like it's Saturday Night Live, except it's not. <laughs> it's, it's Wednesday morning live. So, all right. Thank you so much. And we will, we will, we will, we will hopefully see you soon in person. Absolutely. Yeah. Great seeing you all. Thank Be you. Well. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.